production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, one Faulkner, Mississippi farmer reports bumper wheat yields this spring. You'll travel to Pontotoc to watch cowboys put their horses through obstacles they might find on a ranch. In Southern Gardening, butterflies bring a delicate beauty to the landscape. Find out how to attract them to your yard. In the markets, China continues to cast a shadow on cotton's future, while chicken prices have improved rapidly this year. In the feature segment, most people want to kill or control insects, but a one-of-a-kind workshop at Mississippi State University teaches people to grow them. The International Insect Rearing Workshop attracts participants and companies from around the world. I had been to, uh, to places all over the world, helping them with their corn work, helping them with their rearing program, and we, we began to realize, well, there's no formal education even in entomology departments anywhere that we are aware of in the world that teaches people how to rear insects. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. Some are calling it a bill to nowhere. Well Leighton, attempts are being made to revive the Farm Bill in the U.S. House of Representatives. House Republican leaders are splitting the bill into two parts. The idea is to pass the farm program only section and then the food stamp portion. Farm groups are opposed to this and this is happening as we record Farm Week on Thursday. Well the plan has been backed by House Majority Leader Republican Eric Cantor and some other GOP leaders. Even House Ag Committee Chairman Frank Lucas of Oklahoma says the split appears to be the best alternative we have. House Democrats are less than thrilled. Minority Whip Steny Hoyer of Maryland said that even if the House passed a split bill, the U.S. Senate would not consider a farm bill with no food assistance provisions. Now, 532 farm groups led by the American Farm Bureau and the National Farmers Union are opposed to the split bill plan. The weather in late June was perfect for Mississippi's wheat harvest. Farm Week visited one farm north of the Ripley area near the Tennessee state line where yields were being described as wonderful. There was little time to celebrate though as the process of planting soybeans behind the wheat began even as a combine was still harvesting. At 450 acres, it was the largest winter wheat crop Keith Morton had ever planted on his Tippa County farm. On the first day of harvest, it wasn't long after the combine began crisscrossing his fields in Faulkner that Morton was able to confirm what he already suspected. It was going to be an outstanding harvest. So far, the yields are running about 80 bushels as an average. And praise God, that is a wonderful yield. We've been uh, in some fields that have cut into the hundreds according to the yield monitor. As he usually does, Keith had hired fellow farmer Matt Orman to bring in his combine, harvest the grain and help haul it to the elevator. Meanwhile, the windrows of wheat straw dropped back onto the field by the combine were mechanically bundled into both round bales and square bales by a second custom harvester, a local highway landscape contractor. They buy the wheat straw and they use it on highway projects or right-of-ways or any type of construction uh, project that requires erosion control. So it, uh, it adds another revenue stream for me. Plus it helps get some of the uh, residue out of the way so I can plant into cleaner ground. Keith plants Group 4 soybeans into the wheat stubble immediately while there is moisture. That's one reason he likes to have someone else do the wheat harvesting work as Matt Orman keeps the combine rolling and straw is still being bailed by the highway landscape contractor, Keith Morton is in fact already running the planter in a field already harvested. His object is to get a faster stand of beans. As an experienced no-till farmer, Keith Morton modified the lower front edge of his planter for coming in behind wheat. He mounted residue managers or cleaners to get the stubble out of the way of the disc opener. 
Keith says this provides better seed to soil contact in the wheat stubble for the group four soybeans. From Faulkner, Mississippi, I'm Leighton Span reporting. It's one thing to ride a horse, but it's another to work a horse. The Etiwamba County Horse Association, along with the Southern Obstacle Challenge Association, recently hosted the Extreme Cowboy Races, where the abilities of horses and riders were put to the test. Farm Week's Amy Taylor reports from Pontotoc. For those with a passion for celebrating the skill of horsemanship, Southern Obstacle Challenge Association offers extreme cowboy racing. The challenge is to quickly and correctly ride through the course, which simulates ranch activity. SOCA treasurer Tracy Pinson says all ages can compete at this family-friendly event. We have young guns, which are our little kids that are 11 and under, then we have youth, and then we have a novice division, which, are, which is for people that are uh, new to the extreme cowboy race. We have uh, Ride Smart, which is for people that are 55 and over, and then we've got the um, non-pro division, which are people that are, are have been doing this for some time and are and are pretty good at it, and that but they don't get paid to do it. And then we have our pro division, which is where our, our professionals compete. Additionally, Pinson says high point championships are awarded on regional and national levels. Southern Obstacle Challenge Association offers obstacle challenge and sanctioned. Craig Cameron Extreme Cowboy Race events all over the southeast. Local co-sponsor Vaudry Edge talks about the prizes awarded and how participants prepare for competition. You win big belt buckles <laughs> and belt buckles and all kind of prizes that they get. They give away lots of different prizes. Saddle pads and uh, hay bags and just everything you use on a horse. Halters, just stuff like that. Money, you give away quite a bit of money. We'll just come and watch one and practice and uh, see what to do and set you up obstacles at home. You can make obstacles out of anything. I mean, you know, you can just use stuff you have around the house, anything like that. And you can use any kind of horse. You don't have to have a special horse or nothing. Just come out and have fun and enjoy it. And it's for everybody. It's a family deal. Edge says 58 riders competed at the Extreme Cowboy Race event, which was held at the Pontotoc County Agri Center. From Pontotoc, Mississippi, I'm Amy Taylor reporting. Butterflies are fun guests to any summer flower garden. And this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman shows you how to make butterflies a permanent feature of your garden. Perhaps the most welcome landscape visitors are butterflies. Gardeners love having the various shapes and colors fluttering around their gardens. While everyone enjoys watching butterflies, many gardeners ask, what plants will attract them to your garden? Two characteristics are shared by a majority of butterfly attracting plants, tubular flowers and shades of red. Mexican firecracker cuffia are magnets for butterflies like the beautiful black swallowtail. The black swallowtails also can't resist the Mississippi medallion winner yellow shrimp plant. The orange and black gulf fritillary are attracted to Dallas red lantana, and skipper butterflies really like the spiky flowers of the 2010 Mississippi medallion winner fireworks gomfrina. Duranta has sapphire blue flowers which monarch butterflies simply love. But there will be times in every garden when the butterflies just aren't flying. This is when butterfly garden art can fill in the gaps. For instance, replica butterflies, like these wire forms, can be placed in strategic locations. Or big, larger than life butterflies can appear to be resting on fences and walls. Even signs can be used to warn visitors that entering the garden will be at their own risk. And don't forget to look both ways at butterfly crossings. You can even have mechanical butterflies that flit around and look pretty real. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Now Leighton Gary says that butterflies need plain water as well as flower nectar. And they actually prefer a mud puddle, or you can take a bucket, fill it with water and sand just to where the water is up to where the sand level is, put some rocks and twigs in it, and then they'll have a place to land and drink. <laughs> well, in the feature segment today, most people want to kill insects, but Mississippi State University is teaching some people how to grow them. 
And this week, Leighton and I were at the North Area meeting of the Mississippi Association of uh, Conservation Districts, and we will have something from that on next week's show. Yep. Had a good time. Well, we are at time, though, for the markets with Leighton, and we're recording this just ahead of the monthly release of the USDA crop reports. That's right, Artis. A lot to talk about, as always, so let's get started. And in the markets this week, cotton prices continue in a sideways pattern. The chicken sector's better profit should continue, while in the beef sector, analysts believe tighter cattle numbers later in the year should offer some support. On Thursday morning, cotton futures are currently trading 30 points higher to 33 points lower. It's more of the sideways pattern that's been in place since the month of March. And according to a Dow Jones survey, traders are expecting the USDA to increase new crop ending stocks to 2.95 million bales later Thursday in the new report, compared to 2.6 million in back in the June WASD. Now I got some analysis from Extension Ag economist, Dr. John Michael Riley. John Michael, let's back up to June 28th and talk a moment about the acreage report and cotton. Well, the uh, USDA reported uh, just uh, 10 and a quarter million acres for, of cotton for, for this year. That's both uh, upland and Pima. And then that's a little bit higher than where they were, were pegging that number back in March at the prospective plantings number. Uh, again, it's uh, in, in much lower than where we were at a year ago, a little over 12 million acres a year ago. So uh, prices dictated that uh, some those acres go elsewhere. In Mississippi, 320,000 acres projected for this year compared to uh, 475 last year, but about 50,000 acres more than we were thinking in March. And the slow rate of planting, the rains, the cold weather likely played into uh, some some switching of crops for producers in, in Mississippi. All right, uh, since that report, what has the new crop market been doing in response? Uh, it's been pretty steady, to be honest. Uh, it, it was down on the day because that, that acres number was higher than the March projection, but uh, following that, there's there's been, you know, it's really just been a sideways market. The dollar goes up, the dollar goes down, that impacts the price. Uh, we've, Texas's crop, you know, roughly 56% of the total acres are sitting in Texas. Uh, they've, they're under a lot of stress due to the drought. Uh, their good to excellent ratings just continue to drop, and so that's been supportive of price. A stronger dollar has been, uh, has had a negative impact on price, and those, those factors have, have really played in each day, pushed the market up and down, but for the most part, if you look at, at, at where it's been since that acreage report two weeks ago, uh, it's been mostly sideways. And China, I guess, is still a cloud out there on the horizon. Not sure how to factor that in, right? Yeah. Everybody's still scratching their head. They hold so much in stocks, and what are they going to do with those stocks remains to be the big question. They they're, they're, haven't tipped their hand yet. We're really expecting that they'll hold on to those stocks, and that's kept the market in this 80 to 90 cent range. And condition ratings overall, what are you hearing as far as uh, conditions maybe right now? Nationally, is Mississippi's on the high end. Texas is on the low end nationally, right in the middle. 44% rated, uh, uh, 44 rated uh, uh, good to excellent in the, in the U.S., 72% in Mississippi, good to excellent, 26% in Texas. So like I said, the, the national's right in the middle of, of Mississippi and, and Texas. The trivia quiz this week is about forestry. So let's take a look at our question. What tree was called the redwood of the east? The answer is one of these. Is it longleaf pine or live oak? or American chestnut, or birch? I'll tell you the correct answer at the end of the markets. We're going to pause for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar in the second part of the markets. Leighton Span reports chicken price improvement helps a Mississippi company, while cowmen benefit from higher beef prices. In the feature segment today, it's a one-of-a-kind workshop in the world. It's the insect rearing workshop at Mississippi State University. It helps people grow insects, not kill them. Prepared? I'd better be. After all, paying attention to details is what makes the difference. The more preparation and planning time I invest, the more successful and enjoyable the outcome. For everyone, I know everything can't be perfect. I don't expect it to be, but the time and effort I spent pays off when the unexpected happens. So yes, I prepared for my marriage until death do us part. Prepare for your marriage. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. Mississippi State University will hold its annual Corn and Soybean Day on Thursday, July 18th at Stoneville. Runs from 10 a.m. until the late afternoon. Commercial exhibitors will be on hand to 2.30 p.m. Then research plot tours will start at 2.40 p.m. 
At 10, the On-Target Application Academy will introduce some of the latest in sprayer and application technology. It will also give instruction in the proper techniques to keep herbicides on target and effective. Irrigation technology and tactics will also be highlighted. Song will also be the site of the annual Rice Field Day to be held on Tuesday, July 30th. Registration starts at 2.30 in the afternoon. The trailers will leave the CAP Center at 3.40 to tour the research plots. A rice buyer from Mars Incorporated will be the keynote speaker. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week snapshot. Profits are up in the poultry sector. In fact, Wall Street analysts say the month of May was the U.S. chicken industry's most profitable month ever. Now, traders point to several factors for this rapid improvement, including strong demand and tight supplies in both the United States and Mexico. Now, chicken has also been featured more in both the retail and food service sectors of late due to high beef prices. And analysts say it will likely take the industry 12 to 18 months to expand so the conclusion, with poultry pricing strong enough to overcome feed costs, indicators are that this positive profit cycle may continue into next year. The high beef prices at retail mentioned in the previous story are also on the mind of another analyst. John Roach paints a picture of a lethargic sideways trade for cattle, at least for the near future anyway. We really think that the cattle market is suffering from a sluggish U.S. economy and a, and a high-priced uh, uh, product uh, that, str that is struggling in that environment. Before our feature story, let's check that trivia answer for this week. And the correct choice is C. The American chestnut was called the redwood of the east before the onslaught of a fungus that has almost made it extinct. There are a lot of places where you can learn how to control insects, but there's only one in the world that will teach you how to grow them. This fall, Mississippi State University will teach its 16th Annual International Insect Rearing Workshop on campus in Starkville. There are businesses that need to grow insects, and it's not as easy as you think. Ten of the participants will be from outside the United States. The workshop is already full for this fall, and there's a waiting list. Farm Week's Amy Taylor first brought us this story last November. To most of us, insects are just bugs. But to Mississippi State University entomologist Dr. Frank Davis and other researchers, insects are an essential part of our lives and food sources. Over the past 40 years, insect rearing at MSU has developed into a program recognized worldwide. Dr. Davis elaborates on various types of insect rearing. For instance, crickets and, and uh, mealworms and all for the pet food industry. Okay, they rear that type of insect, all right? There are people in the agricultural area that rear bollworms. Oh, they rear tarnished plant bugs that are all on cotton and all of the other lepidoptera that feed on soybeans and corn. So you have that group that are growing pest insects to do research on to come up with, with uh, solutions to them and uh, then you've got the butterfly people and they rear them for school children education they also rear them for weddings in addition certain insects like the black soldier fly are being considered as healthy food sources for catfish particularly dr davis research has involved rearing the southwestern corn borer cotton boll weevil and later other insects such as the fall armyworm corn earworm and the tobacco budworm for developing plants resistance to these pests as well as pesticide and herbicide research developing insect resistant crop seed and making it available to farmers and seed companies helps maximize the health of crops like corn, cotton, and soybeans. The healthier the plant, the more abundant our crops and food sources will be. With this in mind, Davis and other researchers thought of the idea to develop a formal insect rearing center. In the year 1999, we got together and began to plan an insect rearing center concept. And we had been around the world, some of us. I had been to, uh, to places all over the world, helping them with their corn work, 
helping them with their rearing program. And we, we began to realize, well, there's no formal education, even in entomology departments, anywhere that we are aware of in the world, that teaches people how to rear insects. The Insect Rearing Center at Mississippi State University is quite a unique facility. Insects such as the southwestern corn borer, fall armyworm, and tobacco budworm are reared from larvae to pupa to adult. First, the larvae are actually placed into their food source, a diet specially formulated at the center. They're housed in a room where temperature and humidity are strictly monitored, and once they reach pupa stage, they're placed in a new area where they grow into adults. Dr. Davis says knowing the facility was likely the only one of its kind in the world is what sparked the idea for an international workshop. So in 2000, the intensive five-day workshop titled Principles and Procedures for Rearing High-Quality Insects, designed to cover all major areas of lab-rearing insects and offered on a worldwide basis, was born. Tom Riddell, air filtration specialist with Air Filter Sales and Services in Jackson, said as his discussion focused on how air filtration is connected to insect rearing. I'm not an entomologist. I am a crow teaching with eagles. But there are so many more beneficial items they're finding out today with different research facilities, but they have to be able to know the basics of cleanliness, uh, diet preparation, how to house them properly, and then not harm the people who are doing the research. What I talk to them about is the effective of movement of air and the capture of particles within the air so that we can have a cleaner environment. That way they are reducing the uh, probabilities of viruses and bacteria on the subject insects. Clean air is such a high priority that the facility uses the same type of air cleaning system that you see in hospitals. Additionally, workshop participants were educated about pathology issues such as fungi, bacteria, viruses, protozoan infections in microsporidia, and parasites. Additionally, Gary Needham, entomologist with Syngenta in the United Kingdom, talks about how insect rearing relates to his line of research. I rear pest insects for uh, research into crop protection. I look for potential chemicals that could be used in uh, insecticide and pesticide products. Our aim is to bring plant potential to life, so we look for various ways to get more out of less, basically. I mean, the population is growing. The land space we have to, to grow these crops, to feed the the ever-increasing world population is getting smaller, so we need to get more from the plant. Needham says he'll use what he's learned, such as temperature and humidity control, when he goes back to his own laboratory. In addition to insect rearing for plant research, Tom Riddell says it's also practiced to be used for pharmaceutical research. There's good molds and fungi that can be grown. There's very good, a lot of protein that comes out of certain types of insects. And so the pharmacies are now determining which insects and colonies that need to be promoted and grown in order to produce uh, more products that are beneficial to the health of people around the world, especially third world countries. You can pull molds and viruses off of them. You can find out what causes disease how it's transported. With the vital role insects play in our environment, Dr. Frank Davis and Gary Needham say our world would not survive without insects. What would happen to us if we lost all of our pollinating insects? Well, you would, you would not have, you would not be able to grow certain plant crops. And that's why the honeybee is so important to the United States, and that's why they're spending so much money uh, trying to make sure that we don't lose our honeybees. Insect pollination contributes to over $130 billion in, into the crop business, into the crop industry a year. Um, they contribute to about two thirds of the food we put on our plate. Um, and if they disappeared tomorrow, within a matter of months, we'd be starving to death. In the 12 years of successful international insect rearing workshops, Dr. Frank Davis says the event has become so popular, it's sold out every year. As many as 25 participants from one company have attended the workshop to gain knowledge in those nine areas that are so important to successfully rearing insects. From Mississippi State University, I'm Amy Taylor reporting.
And if you'd like to watch this story again, you can go to our Farm Week website, Facebook page, or YouTube page. If you're interested in more information on the International Insect Rearing Workshop, we'll have its contact information as well. That's farmweek.msucares.com. Well, Aiden, the latest edition of the uh, workshop takes place in early November. The 26-member class is already full. There's a waiting list. Uh, Ten of the students will hail from outside the United States. Nine work in the public sector, and 17 work for private business. So I think that speaks to the content of that workshop. I think it does. Speaks to it very well. Well, we're at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, the Teachers Conservation Workshop celebrates its 50th anniversary in Mississippi. That workshop uses hands-on demonstrations to help school teachers learn about how forestry and conservation practices can be integrated into classroom teaching. In Southern Gardening Hardscapes, see how your landscape can be enhanced by designing in some accents. And before we go today, we're going to say goodbye to a member of the uh, TV Center crew here at Mississippi State University. Come on in, Sarah. Sarah Ray is leaving us after seven years. And she is great. She's a professional, but she made the work fun. One of the important behind-the-scenes people. That's right. And we look forward to hearing good things in the future. And we thank you for all you've done in thank seven you. years. I've, I've enjoyed my time. It's, it's been a real pleasure. I look forward to you guys every week. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it for this week on Farm Week. I'm Leighton Spann for Artist Ford. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.